Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before God, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the covenant of blood to be lifted to unreachable heights to us and to break all evil and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed, as before, all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, covetousness, ignorance, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy nation and stand, Lord, in the place of your rest, you and the ark of your greatness, and may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, and allow us to find your holy countenance. May the service be presented into your divine arms. Guide it with your uplifted hand. Almighty God, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. Христос возвратится, 
за народа, который был верен ему. И он скажет, войдите, наследники неба, вы достойны со мной быть на прочном пиру. И он скажет, войдите, наследники неба, вы достойны со мной быть на прочном пиру. Остались миллионы воскреснут на Боге, чтобы вместе живыми писать при судом. Самый храбрый воскликнет при Бога великий, Вся земля возрыдает при грозный Христом. Самый храбрый воскликнет при Бога великий, Вся земля возрыдает при грозный Христом. Приближается день Твой, Господь всемогущий, Когда все народы придут пред Тобой, Затрубит громогласно Архангел трубою, Собирает народы от края до края земли, Затрубит громогласно Архангел трубою,
4 книга царств. Глава 2. 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 19 through 22. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. The city that this is referring to is Jericho, which means the city of palm trees or the city of righteousness. As it is written, the righteous shall flourish in Psalms 92 verses 13 through 16. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright and that there is no unrighteousness in Him. Psalms 92 verses 13 through 16. However, despite this, the water of this city was not healthy because of which the earth of this city was also barren. In order to heal the water of the city of palms, Elisha asked for a new cup and for salt to be placed in there. And when this was fulfilled, Elisha went out to the water that had nurtured the water and he threw salt in there. And as we see here, the water was made healthy. And there was no death from drinking this water and there was no barrenness any longer. Figuratively, the righteous of the inhabitants of the city of Palms, their righteousness was founded on the works of the law. But when they became a new creation or a new cup in Christ Jesus and they had made a new covenant in holiness presented in the dignity of salt, their water was made healthy. By examining this image, in relation to the soil of the human heart, it follows that this is referring to a category of people that tried to become righteous before God by relying on the law of works that are written in either the law of Moses or in their own so-called good laws that come from their own flesh, from their own understanding about that which is good and that which is evil. If the faith teaching with which we nourish our hearts, if it carries barrenness and death, this means that the source of the water that comes from our heart through the proclamation of our faith does not meet the requirements of the reigning teaching of Jesus Christ. At the foundation of every faith teaching, there is some kind of foundation upon which um, the building of the whole faith teaching shall be built. The foundation of the faith teaching of the Old and the New Testament was the statutes of offering God of tithes and offerings. The statutes of the commandment of offering God of tithes testified of the belonging of a person to the covenant with God as well as his worship in which he was called to honor God. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3 verses 7 and 10. As you can see, this commandment lies at the foundation of the Old Testament as well as the foundation of the New Testament. The difference is comprised of this, that in the Old Testament, tithes were accepted by um, those who were dead. And in the New Testament, the first, uh, the priest Christ is, it is accepted by. According to this, the soil of the heart in its offering of fruit in a certain sense is made dependent on the quality of healthy water. Under healthy water, we are referring to the faith teaching that is founded on the making of a new testament presented in a new cup in which is placed the salt of the covenant in which a person could search for God. And therefore, if the water that nurtures 
um, the soil of our heart is healthy or good, then the, the land that is nurtured by this will be able to accept the seed of the kingdom of heaven and will be able to produce the fruit of righteousness. But if the land, according to its nature, will be will be unclean, then even by being nourished with good water, it will still bring bad fruit. Because this person, an offering God of tithes, will search not for God, but for material blessings, which God blessed him with, with which God could bless him with. Everything will depend on the, our search for those goals which will be contained in the heart of a person and define and they will define the quality of his soil. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7 8. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs, useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. As you can see, the water is good that comes from the heavens, but one land produces good. Uh, and the other produces thorns, although the earth is the same. And therefore, from these words, it follows to distinguish in our heart not just the, the good land from the thorns and thistles, but what kind of sacrifice and what kind of harvest a person will inherit as he who brings this goodness or retribution. And so I will remind you of one of the parables of Christ where he shows how he is going to cleanse his kingdom from people who have come to God. Matthew chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So the water is good, but the land is... is is bad. And another place of scripture is the contrary. Those but he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces. People who search for material prosperity and who use for this goal principles of, of figurative thinking in order to be materially enriched they are like the winnowing fan of the Lord that frees the body of Christ from thistles and binds them in preparation for being burned. Whereas those who search for the offering of in the offering of tithes, knowledge of God, they affirm themselves as being hallowed unto God, because of which they receive the unique opportunity to offer fruit to God, which as a result will be transformed by God into the power of eternal life in their bodies. And therefore, right now, we are going to honor God and worship Him in tithes and offerings. We will sing together, and we will stand. This is our unique opportunity to each time we honor God in tithes and offerings to cut the root of all evil, which is love for money, so that we can take authority over money. God is not against us not having any needs, but He is against His blessings becoming our masters. He wants us to be masters over those blessings which He sends to us. And therefore, let us sing. And so each time when Israel had honored God in tithes and offerings, either in the temple or in the temple of Solomon, they were called to, according to the words of Moses, which he had received from God as a revelation, to raise their hands over their offerings and to proclaim one unique proclamation that they were faithful to for thousands of years. We, being that same Israel, tied to that same root, drinking from the fruit of the same olive tree, will do the same thing. Please raise your right hand, a symbol of your righteous act, over your offerings and pray along with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I have separated the tithes from my home and brought them into your home so that your home may have food. I do not give them imperially, I do not give them in sorrow, and I do not give them for the dead. I rejoice that I have the privilege 
to acknowledge and express my love and to accept your authority. And according to your word, I ask you, right now, may your heavenly windows be opened and may your blessing come down abundantly upon your redeemed nation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen, amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. Может, закон тяжелый исполнить, невинная 
And so if you have a Bible, please open with me a familiar place of scripture for us in which is contained an abyss of wisdom and not understandable by us 
yet truth. Matthew chapter 5, verses 45 and 48. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The sermon that I would like to continue is called Called to Perfection. And in conjunction with our study of the path that leads us to perfection, we begin to study the path that leads us to God, our Bridegroom, in the event that is the image of Rebecca's path to Isaac. We will begin to look at the signs presented in the Bride of the Lamb, whom Rebecca represents in the virtue of Lily of the Valley, that we are called, as, as it is written, look at the lily, how it grows, that we are called to look upon with the eyes of our heart or eyes of our faith, so that we could form ourselves into an image of perfection inherent to our Heavenly Father. And for this purpose, Rebecca left her nation, her household, and her former life to follow Eleazar to Isaac, her groom. Eleazar is presented in Scripture as an image of the Holy Spirit that came down on the disciples of the Lord on the day of the Pentecost to bring the small flock to perfection in Christ Jesus. His name means God is help which points to the Holy Spirit. We have noted that in our case, celebrating the Feast of the Pentecost is accepting the Holy Spirit in our heart not as a highly valued guest, how Bethuel and Laban had represented him, but as the Lord and ruler of our life, how Rebecca represented him, which will allow us to bind ourselves to the Holy Spirit on the conditions established in Scripture. Romans 8.14 For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. It says, for those who speak in tongues, the children of God, but those who are led, are the sons of God. We have noted that when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we receive a unique and faithful opportunity to either accept the Holy Spirit as a ruler in our life in order to receive power from Him and in Him to create total and complete separation from our nation, our household, and our corrupt desires so that in the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit we could bring God fruit of righteousness in the subject of a godly life carrying within it the resurrection of Christ, or to accept the Holy Spirit as a valued guest and continue to remain dependent on our nation, our household, and our corrupt desires. Being a guest, the Holy Spirit does not have any legal rights to control a person and to entrust in him the revelations of the Heavenly Father. A person who is not taught how to accept the Holy Spirit as the ruler of his life can never bind himself to the Holy Spirit, and consequently, he can never be led by the Holy Spirit, or he can never follow him to perfection in Christ Jesus. Because of this, he will lose his title as son that is expressed in salvation. On numerous occasions, we have focused our attention to the fact that according to scripture it is possible to speak in foreign tongues and to not lack any gifts but at the same time remain carnal and lack the spirit and to go against everything that comes from the spirit of God so yes a person when baptized the Holy Spirit he has accepted the Holy Spirit and he did begin to speak in tongues but how did he accept the spirit Holy Spirit you are a guest of the heavens. He was accepted as a guest. No one taught him how to accept him as the Lord and ruler of his life. No one taught him how to prepare what conditions must be fulfilled. And so, speaking in tongues and practicing gifts of the Spirit is a spiritual experience, but it does not make us holy, and it does not change the character that we have inherited from the vain life of our forefathers into the character of Christ. To change our character to the character of Christ, we need truth about the cross of Christ that is contained in the teaching of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh, called to separate us from our nation, our household, and our carnal life. In a certain format, we have already studied what the core of the cross of Christ is, what the core of our cross is, and how our cross differs from the cross of Christ, as well as on the foundation of which principles can our cross work with the cross of Christ. We have stopped to examine the next question. On what grounds can we define that our cross is truly working with the cross of Christ and not his forgery? 
And these signs are called to be fruit of righteousness or fruit of resurrection and the fruit of the tree of life, yielding its fruit twelve times, bringing fruit each month. This tree of life is supposed to be the kingdom of heaven in us. The key that unlocks the path to the tree of life is presented in the image of the twelve pearly gates that express our being with Christ in his trials. As we sang today, the pearl, a pearl represents trials. It is the result of enduring hard suffering. You cannot, I give this to you, grace to you as a gift, but if you do not become a pearl, if you do not become a pearl, then I will cast you out of my mouth. This is what Christ says about this in Luke 22, 20 through 30. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. We have said numerous times that a pearl is a product of suffering, the result of the suffering of a clam. When in this clam there becomes a sand or a foreign, foreign body, it needs to, it begins to suffer because it tries to stand against from it. We cannot rid ourselves off of our dying body, and it is necessary for us, and we suffer from this. Those who are spiritual know who, what I'm talking about, because a carnal person does not suffer from this. His spirit suffers, not himself. But when he dies for his nation, for his household, and for his corrupt life, a person begins to suffer. He cannot, through this dying body, to show glory to Christ, to show his might. And then these sufferings begin, begin to develop the resurrection of life in him, and he begins to clothe himself in the resurrection of life, clothe himself, in, himself into the new man who is created by God in righteousness and holiness of truth. That's why the kingdom of heaven is expressed in inheriting eternal life that is presented in the tree of life bearing twelve fruits, and each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree which are for the healing of the nations for the healing, that means that you will be a light to this world. The light will heal. And this will occur here on earth, because in heaven, healing is not needed. There will not be any illnesses. Because that's why in Revelation, when it's talking about Jerusalem, this tree of light, this is referring to Jerusalem, the high Jerusalem that is located for now here on earth. Furthermore, the twelve months of the sacred year where the tree of life gave its fruit each month are fruits of resurrection that are yielded in the images of the feasts and celebrations that occurred during each month of the sacred year. In a certain format, we have already studied the fruit of our spirit presented in the image of the fruits of the tree of life brought in the first three months of the sacred year. And we have stopped to study the fruit of the spirit in the fruit of the tree of life of the fourth month by the name of Tammuz, which we are called to bring to God to answer to the standard of perfection that is inherent to our Heavenly Father. We remembered and we have discovered that in Israel on the 17th day of the fourth month Tammuz, a fast was observed in memory of Moses breaking the tablets of the covenant law. In Israel, the days of the fast were considered a demonstration of sorrow in which a person afflicted his soul. And during prayer, he spread out the sackcloth and ashes to demonstrate before God the affliction and humility of his soul. But God didn't like something in this. Because we can have uh, an outer weird of outer form or outer view of sorrow as the Pharisees did inside they did not have this state but outwardly they showed that they fasted and they were sorrowful and then God through Isaiah through the prophet Isaiah had said is it a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? So here, God clearly intended to do something. Through the acts of His grace, He wanted to change the atmosphere of fasting 
so that it could be triumphant and joyful. And this is what he did through Ze Zechariah 8, 18 through 19. And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month in which the tablets of testimony were broken, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. In this case, to verify that the breaking of the tablets of testimony occurred on the 17th day of the fourth month, it would be enough to subtract 40 days from the 17th day of the fourth month, and we will arrive at the seventh day of the third month. This is the day of the new moon when Moses went up on Mount Sinai. In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day of the new moon, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Exodus 9. 19, 1-4. In this manner, the new moon of the third month is an image, it was the day when Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai, it's an image of the birth of a new man who was created by God in righteousness and holiness of truth, because the new moon is always an example of the bride of the Lamb. In 40 days during which God wrote the Decalogue of His law with the people of Israel is an image of the state of infancy, the, the deliverance from which was marked by the breaking of the tablets of testimony in which were fulfilled the days of purification. And only after fulfilling the days of purification on the 40th day, a male child could be presented before the Lord for dedication. The same way it was done with Jesus in Luke 2, 22-23. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. In Scripture, the image of purification is an image of justification that a person could receive as a gift of grace through redemption in Jesus Christ. Furthermore, in the fourth month, inhabitants of mountainous regions began to harvest wheat, and the maturation of the first grapes began, which coincided with the onset of the summer heat. So in practice, each feast was accompanied by some kind of harvest, or rather, was a harvest of some kind of crop. The image of the event of the 40th day as the days in which purification was made, which was marked by the breaking of the tablets of testimony, was presented an image of the teaching of Jesus Christ destroying the teaching that we had that was against us. Colossians 2, 11-15 In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh this is to take off the sinful nature, to take the sinful life off of us. By buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So the resurrection, this is referring in the referring to the new tablets. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. We know that Jesus is the image of the Word of God. That's why the te Decalogue and the breaking of the tablets was Christ, and this was his death. And the new tablets was his resurrection. If a person does not bring fruit of the new fourth month expressed in the broken tablets of the covenant law as proof that he and Christ Jesus died for the law of Moses so that he could live for God and live by God, then he will lose the salvation which he received in the format of a pledge. This is what the Holy Spirit said, Galatians 2, 19-20. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so, in this event, we saw the result of a confrontation in ourselves of two glorious, great, powerful, and tectonic laws. This is the law that gives power to sin and the law that deprives sin of this power.
Both laws are individually defined and together represent the holy, eternal, and unchanging nature of God. This is a law of grace in which God does not impute sin. However, before we, with the power of the law that gives power to sin, die for the power of sin so we can live for God, it is necessary to be born from the seed of the word of truth as it is written. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James 1.18 only by being born from the seed of the word of truth, we stand before the opportunity and necessity to die to the law so that we can live for God through crucifixion with Christ. Based on this, we noted that we must distinguish the justification we receive at the moment of our birth from the seed of the word of truth from the other kind of justification that we are called to receive as an affirmation of the justification we have previously received. Because there exists a big difference between the seed of justification through which we are born of God from the fruit of the seed, in which our justification brings fruit of righteousness and receives affirmation of righteousness. And to bring fruit of the tree of life of the fourth month, representing the kingdom of heaven that has descended in power in our heart, yielded by our justification which we are called to bring fruit of righteousness, we will need to answer four classic questions. Specifically, first, what is the nature or root of righteousness? Out of what source does righteousness flow from? And what is justification? As well as, with what characteristics does Scripture endow the word truth, justification, righteous, and righteousness? Second, what purpose is justification supposed to fulfill, or how is justification supposed to manifest itself? What conditions are necessary to fulfill, to accept justification and be clothed in righteousness? And according to what results can we determine that we have the tree of life in our spirit, which brings fruit in the fourth month, specifically fruit of righteousness? We have noted that the etymology of the words righteousness, justification, righteous, and righteousness in Hebrew contain very rich meanings because the meanings are a revelation of who God is for us and what He has done for us and what we, must we do to inherit all that God has done for us. And so in Hebrew, righteousness or truth means holiness, law, covenant, justification. Righteousness, lawful, fairness, commandment, statute, decree. Righteousness is court, justice, fairness. Truth or righteousness is straightness, loyalty, truthfulness, consistency, duration, immutability, truthfulness or truth, wisdom, the light of life, honesty, sincerity, purity, resurrection of life, and the freedom of Christ. And justification is eternal redemption. It is a ransom from the captivity of sin and death. It is abolition of guilt or not the imputation of sin. It is taken into the ownership and the lot of God. It is resurrection, resurrection from the dead. Whereas the word righteous relating to God and to man means holy, in relation to man, holy, so separated for God, pleasing, innocent, without blemish, honest, fair, free from oath, not bound by sin, dead to sin, a light for the truth, being in the covenant with God, trusting and hoping in God, pleasant, finding favor with God, he who honors God with tithes and offerings, being in God and rejoicing in God and propagating the fragrance of Christ. And righteousness that a person is supposed to demonstrate is hope and trust in God. If we have hope and trust, then we are already demonstrating righteousness. It is faith in the fact that there is a God and those who seek Him, He rewards. Righteousness is peace with God based on a covenant with God. Righteousness is consecration of one's dedication. Righteousness is observing the justice of God. Righteousness is the phenomenon of holiness in the performance of justice. Righteousness is the phenomenon of immutable joy. Righteousness is remaining in your assembly. 
Righteousness is offering to God a sacrifice of praise. Righteousness is honoring God with tithes and offerings. And righteousness is showing goodness in our faith. With these meanings, we highlighted the fact that to see these terms as legitimate, legitimate with regard to man can only be done in the format, in the boundaries of the service of justification. That relates, it relates to the New Testament because the service of justification is founded and affirmed in the law of grace that withstands the service of condemnation in the format of the law of Moses that acts on a person until he leaves infancy. Although a person has been born according to grace, he is still under the law of Moses until he leaves infancy. The law will expand in him until we so when we are infants, we are slaves. Only when we grow into the full measure, we leave out of slavery of the law and we become slaves to righteousness. If the format of Moses in the service of condemnation is founded on stone tablets and is written by God and was given to a sinful and lawless man, then in this manner it gave power to sin and condemned man to death. But after the breaking of the tablets in which a person received justification, new tablets of testimony were formed and were written not by God this time, but man. This is an image of implementing and writing truths and righteousness in the heart of man, which already had justification since he was born, thanks to the broken tablets of testimony. Considering that this form of justification that a person received in the new in the broken tablets of testimony is an image of the new tablets of testimony written by man on the tablets of his own heart could not judge the righteousness of God in man on the contrary it endowed a righteous person with the power to be a servant of the new law so he could fulfill the righteousness of God 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 11 he made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit so in order to be ministers of the new covenant we must not be infants in Christ but we must leave infancy because the the letter kills and the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away? How will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had a glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. According to these words, God's righteousness shown in the boundaries of grace moved in the broken tablets of testimony and began representing a new heart in the new tablets of testimony. This is the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ. And a righteous person is a God-fearing man who honors the law of grace, lives by the law of grace, and does not sin against the law of grace. We had to consider that righteousness is defined and finds itself in the holiness of truth, and it was necessary for us to define the root of these two terms and what grows from this root. According to definitions in Scripture, righteousness comes from the mutual root of two terms, holiness and truth, or holy truth. Whereas the combination of holiness and truth reproduce themselves in righteousness, the same way a father reproduces himself in his son, or a seed reproduces itself in fruit. Therefore, holiness of truth defines the state of the heart of man, whereas righteousness is the expression of the state that is in the holiness of truth. So therefore, the authenticity of righteousness is always intended to be checked and affirmed by the source of its origin, or rather the root of the holiness of truth or the holy word of truth in Scripture. Because the righteousness of God is first and foremost the judgment of God or the justice of God, which is the definition of good and evil and the separation of good and evil, then we in a certain format have already looked at certain characteristics of God's righteousness in the heart of a man. 
We have noted that the judgment of every righteousness of God revealed in the broken tablets is eternal and comes from the truth of the Word of God, which by nature is the source, root, and foundation of the judgment of every righteousness. Psalms 119, 160. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. We have noted that when we are referring to the word of God that comes from the mouth of God and determines the eternal essence of God, this is truth. We must always know that first and foremost, it is holy truth that determines the inner state of the depths of God. Because God, according to his eternal, unchanging, and immeasurable natural essence, is first and foremost always holy. Because of this, God's righteousness is first and foremost always holy, eternal, unchanging, and unconditional. The word holy, first and foremost, always refers to God and those who are born from God. And the essence of this characteristic is in the fact that God, who is holy by nature, is always separated from sin and is not involved in the emergence of sin. Therefore, his love is first and foremost always also his holy love, and therefore it is a love that chooses. And God cannot love anything that is not holy in origin. His holy love is always proportionate to his holy hate toward evil and lawlessness. He unconditionally loves all of that which is holy in origin, and he unconditionally hates all of that which is lawless in origin. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Psalms 45, 8. Apostle Paul had said this verse in Hebrews. Furthermore, we have noted that righteousness and lawlessness are two programs that oppose one another. If they are not in a device, which is a person or an angel, these programs cannot manifest themselves. Evil and good, they are not abstract things. They cannot exist outside of man. They can only be called good or evil in man. But with outside of man, they cannot be called so. That's why God had initially loved his holy righteousness in people and angels, initially hated lawlessness in people and angels, along with people and angels themselves. Therefore, the carriers of lawlessness, angels who do not maintain their virtue, and people who do not love the truth and defile the sanctuary of their spirit, they are the vessel of his scorching and his all incinerating anger. Whereas the carriers of his holy righteousness, who have kept themselves from being involved in wickedness and have obtained victory over death, they are the vessels of his mercy. As it is written, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, Romans 9, 22 to 20. So referring to those who are called, in a certain format, as much as God and the level of our faith have allowed us, we have already studied the personified essence of God's righteousness in the face of the Heavenly Father, Son of God, and the Holy Spirit, and have stopped to study the righteousness of God in the face of saints in the form of the justification. We have stopped to study the purpose of God's righteousness in the heart of a person. What purpose is the righteousness of God in our heart intended to fulfill? During our previous service, we began to study one important factor in the the purpose of righteousness in the heart of man, accepted by man in the broken tablets of testimony and affirmed in the new tablets of his heart. And the purpose of righteousness in the heart of a person accepted by him in the broken tablets of testimony and affirmed in the new tablets of his new heart are directed toward these goals to give the opportunity for his servant who represents the broken tablets of testimony in the heart of a righteous person to bring forth justice in which he with a bruised reed will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench 
and we will, he will bring forth justice for truth till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. This is written Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He shall bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. We have noted that all of the work on earth that God had intended to fulfill through His Son, Jesus Christ, could not be fulfilled unless it is done so through a righteous person in whom Christ abides in the face of the Holy Spirit who abides in Christ. So Christ will not do this Himself. He will do this through His church. Because when a person has created a man on earth, he said, let he be in the likeness of my image, and may he have dominion here on earth, how I, as I have dominion in heaven. In this manner, God had limited his interference in acts here on earth. He cannot interfere without man. Only a person who is in likeness of him can give him the right to fulfill his will on earth. And so if a person says that he is fulfilling the righteousness of God, but he cannot test himself to see who he is in Jesus Christ and who is Christ in his heart, then this person cannot know how to fulfill the righteousness of God. And to test ourselves to see if we have righteousness in the acts of righteousness in the proclamation of the judgments of God, it was necessary for us to take a look at four components of righteousness that are contained in the given prophecy. This is that God holds us by our right hand, second, that we are chosen by God out of the many who are called to salvation, how do we determine how am I chosen out of the many who are called? Because only those who are chosen, they receive salvation, and the rest are headed towards perdition. They cannot be saved. Third, that the soul of God yearns for us. And four, that God has placed His Spirit upon us. And then we will provide definitions for the acts of righteousness in this prophecy with which we are called to fulfill our righteousness in the manufacturing of the judgments of God. In the first characteristics in which our righteousness is called to fulfill the justice of God will be comprised of the fact that we, as his servant, so as the Son of God, will not cry out and lift our voice and will not allow it to be heard in the streets. Second, we will not break a bruised reed nor quench a smoking flax. Three, we will create judgment according to truth. Fourth, we will not fail nor be discouraged till we have established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Not just all of the earth, but just so that the coastlands could wait or have trust in his law. And you already know what coastlands are. Coastlands that are divided by water. They are an image of people who are chosen, who have been consecrated. Because when Elijah had watered out the water on the sacrifice, it had divided him, div divided him from the nation, from the people. And then he could bring to God a sacrifice that was separated from the people. And when we're talking about coastlands, we're talking about those saints, those holy saints who have divided themselves, who have died for their nation, their household, and for their corrupt desires. And so first, we turn to the definitions of righteousness that are contained in this prophecy. The first question, what definitions are contained in Scripture that show us that God holds us by our right hand? In answering this question, we have noted that for God to hold us by our right hand, it is necessary in all circumstances, to stand on the side of the entrance of God, which means treat everyone and everything how God would treat them. Psalm 73, 23, 24 says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Do you remember this, the older son in the Proverbs about the two sons, the parable? The older son says, You do not even give me an animal to rejoice with my friends. He was not with his father. He had friends who were not the friends of his father, but the younger son who had left his his friends who had left everything although he was in ruins he came to the father and he said I do not have anything 
Can you accept me as part at least of your, of your servants? I don't have any clothing, any friends, anything. The father gives him new clothing, shoes on his feet, and he creates a feast in all his kingdom. The older one seeing this, he says, you do not even give me a, a goat to rejoice with my friends. He had his own righteousness. He had his own garments. He had his own view on evangelism, on what being good meant. He thought that all that what he had was doing, that the father was supposed to pay him for this. But he says, you are supposed to rejoice at what your brother has received. I give my inheritance to those who come without their friends so that you could become this coastland. So I am always with you. That's why according to these words, God holds a person by his right hand through his dream that is yielded by his light or his revelation. When a person leaves everything and when he accepts the words of God, in this manner the right hand of man will be the fruit of righteousness that is grown by man from the cooperation of the truth of Thumim abiding in his heart with the revelation of Urim. We have already talked about that Thumim is a teaching of Jesus Christ that we have accepted, whereas Urim is the revelation of the Holy Spirit on that that we have accepted but do not yet understand. Therefore, the right hand of God is his word in the format of his revelations regarding the mystery of Thumim that abides in our heart. Whereas the right hand of man that God has taken hold of is Thumim in the format of the teaching of Christ that abides in our heart. If a person does not have the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, in his heart, God cannot hold him. God has nothing to hold him by. The right hand of man is his righteousness. It's not just the right or the left hand, but the righteousness of man. Second, what arguments in Scripture affirm us being chosen by God out of the many who are called to salvation? We have come to the conclusion that proof of us being chosen out of the many that are called to salvation is being clothed in wedding garments in the virtue of our new man, created by God in Jesus Christ in the righteousness and holiness of truth. When in the parable, all who had come to the kingdom, so the first people did not come, the older brother, he said, I have my own fields to tend to. I have brought them, now I have to tend to them. And he says, I have brought animals and I need to care for them. And another one says, I brought a house and I need to care for it. So everyone, they all went to evangelism and no one came to the feast. Feast is to hear about the word of the kingdom of heaven, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Not salvation, but the kingdom. Salvation is not given without the kingdom. Christ had preached not about salvation, but about the kingdom of heaven in which a person could receive salvation. So the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom. That's why this person came there without garments, and he was taken out of there. This was his own righteousness. Wedding garments is righteousness that a person receives by a gift of grace and affirms in the new tablets. The third question that we have already examined, what signs are defined in Scripture that demonstrate that the soul of God yearns for us? This is the ability to create a continual prayer that could fully answer to the conditions of a breastplate of judgment, representing the conditions of the will of God in its three sacred levels, good, acceptable, and perfect. As it is written, now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Not just what we had thought of, but we learn about the will of God. We say that we know that God desires this, and this will is written in Scripture, and we ask of that which is written in Scripture according to His will. And when we know that He hears us, what we ask of Him, we know that we receive what we ask for, because we do it according to His will. That's why, in order to test ourselves to see if our prayer is answering to the conditions of a breastplate of judgment, this should be done based on what we search for in prayer, which is called to be the path of God contained in the three wills of God. 
Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people. But you have not let me, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you will find grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name, Exodus 33, 12-17. Fourth, what signs are defined in Scripture as demonstrating that God has placed His Spirit upon us? The definition that yields the fruit of our righteousness and that God has placed His Spirit upon us is being led by the Holy Spirit by accepting Him as a Lord and ruler of our life in which we could gain the authority and ability to carry out the judgments of God. John 5.30 I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. According to these words, to test the root of righteousness should be done by the ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in our spirit and judge according to what we have heard. Whereas to define and test the voice of the Holy Spirit, to distinguish it from the voices of others, should be done by testing to see which will we are searching for, the will of God or the will of a seductress. And to distinguish the will of God from the will of a seductress should be done by the character of the will of God that is contained in Holy Scripture in the format of a good, acceptable, and perfect will. To receive access to knowing the will of God in its three forms is possible through our dedication to God that is defined by the presentation of our bodies to God as living, holy, and pleasing to God for reasonable service. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so, if we do not have this kind of evidence that could testify of our righteousness in these four signs, then this means that we have not yet approached fulfilling our calling in God to be His light and to be His salt. And we must be clothed in garments of righteousness and have evidence of our righteousness and that God holds us by our right hand, that we are chosen by God out of the many who are called to salvation, that the soul of God yearns for us, and that God has placed His Spirit upon us. And for this person, we should follow the humble who, in order to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in their heart in the format of the gospel word to the messengers of God, incline their ear to the origin of God in the face of his messengers. Isaiah 41, 4 through 5. Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last I am he. The coastlands saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid. They drew near and came. Now let's turn to the definitions of the character righteousness in which we are called to administer the justice of God. And so the first question, what does the phrase, we will not cry out and lift our voice and will not allow it to be heard in the streets, mean in regards to the character of a righteous person? So we can distinguish the voice of our Lord and Teacher. I think it would be best to begin by considering the answer in which the person who is doing the truth, following the example of his Lord, will not let his voice out in the streets. The answer to this question will facilitate the perception of the nature of the voice itself, of which it is said, we will not cry out and lift our voice and will not allow it to be heard in the streets. The thing is, is that in Hebrew the phrase, will not cry out and lift his voice out in the streets, means that God will not allow his voice to be heard to those who are called, but only to those who are His and who will accept His voice under His conditions. 
He will not let them hear in the streets. So he has his place where he allows his voice to be heard. You will not hear his voice in the streets. They say to him, you have taught us in the streets. No, his voice was not in the streets because in Jerusalem there are no streets. There is only one street. There is only one. And they said, you taught us in the streets. That's why this means that the Lord will not allow His voice to be heard by those who are outwardly, but only to those whom He has chosen. Matthew 13, 15 For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Because if they do not hear his voice, because when they hear it, they will turn to them. But because they had sinned, that is impossible to renew with repentance because they turned away from him. They began to affirm their righteousness. They had created their own streets. They began to teach in the streets, began to cast out demons in the streets, to heal on the streets. He said, stay away from me. I have never known you, those who do lawlessness. That's why according to this prophecy, people, due to the hardness of their heart, place themselves outside of the joy of God. Therefore, God places them in the harvest that was sown by them. And in this manner, the principle of sowing and reaping that says he will reap what he sows yields the love of God that chooses toward the chosen. God hates those who reject his love that is endowed by his order and his will, and he loves those who choose his order and his will. He calls them his church. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, See here, he has loved only the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25-27. I want to remind you that the word church is the assembly of those who are saved. That's why the bride, it is always out of the assembly of those who are saved. But those who are in the church are always the bride because they did not allow God to choose them. They tried, They chose something else. That's why the full meaning of the phrase will not cry out or allow his voice to be heard in the streets of means, will not allow himself to be heard by those who do not place themselves in salvation, will not allow his voice to be heard by strangers, will direct his voice towards his own, will direct his voice towards those who enter by the narrow gate. And those who go by the broad path, they will not hear his voice. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able, because they will not be able to hear his voice. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drink in your presence, and you taught us in your streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, to sit down in the kingdom of God. Luke 13, 23 through 29. From what west, east, and south? So here, east, west, north, this is the teaching of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh. The four base teachings, each of which has three doctrines. And there, from there, these people will come, and they will be in the kingdom of heaven. And so, to summarize this point, we must not allow our voices to be heard on the streets for those who do not file the requirements of streets of the High Jerusalem. This is a commandment, the fulfillment of which will allow us the right to enter to the tree of life and the right to enter by the gates through which the tree of life grows. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to 
food, the tree of life. It may enter through the gates into the city, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and those whoever loves and practices a lie. So idolaters, those who do immoral murderers, are those who have sent themselves toward evangelism and they try to do good things. A good, a, a, someone who does good but is based off the flesh and not the spirit. Evangelism that comes from the spirit, it will occur in the church under its expiration from the Holy Spirit and a person who will be sent by an apostle for evangelism. All the rest will be evangelists in their own homes and in their, at their jobs. They will be a light. Tho a thousand church in Antioch, and God sends only two. And take a look at who these two are. These were not people who, were, who had just come to God two or three months ago or finishing courses of evangelism six months. They are people who were born in an Israel family and the first word that they had said was Yahweh, Adonai, God. They were 12 years old. Men knew the f first five books by memory. Whatever they had done, whatever they had spoken about, this nation was unique in that they began to learn and to memorize and they spoke of the meanings of Scripture. And that's why Paul, of whom is written, knowing all, knowing discipline, God chooses people who have a lot of knowledge. He said, give to me Barnabas and Saul, and these people become apostles. Evangelize. Take a look at who evangelizes today. The church sends to some kind of park, to some kind of city park, saying, you two go there, you two go to those people, and you go to those people. And people begin to come up to these people. Someone says, I came to one woman. She was older, and I came to her. I looked at her, I looked at her eyes, and I said, are you ready to die? She looked at me and she said, are you dumb? Well, of course, but he, with such wisdom, explains this to me that, yeah, as I have shared with you before, that I brought a person to church the very first time. I had met him and I brought him. And after church, one young brother comes up to him and says, do you want to give your heart to God? He says, no. And he says to me, I wanted to punch him in the face, but because of you, I did not punch him. How long has he been going for church? And I said, his whole life. And he says to me, interesting that this person has been going to church and he has not yet given his heart. And I've come here for the first time and he wants me to give my heart. So what is this talking about? This means that these are these kind of evangelists they come and they do not know that they are going to speak who is Christ they don't know who Christ who God is for them and what God has done they were not sent they were sent by those who are like himself so all of these churches nowadays a lot of them are focused on evangelism whereas we are called to bring fruit and fruit will then or attract other people when I prayed and said Lord what do I do in regards to evangelism you have called me to be your servant and to carry your flock. And he said to me, bring fruit. If you will be as my words are, I will make you so that you, not you will go to them, but they will come to you. Understand this correctly. When God needs to and when the church will be a light, then people will come from different countries to be a part of this kind of church because the light will be shining from it. Look, there was no radio, there was no telegram, there was nothing on TV, no journals. How, when John the Baptist had come to preach into the wilderness, people had come to him from all of Israel and from all different countries. Who told them who had directed their hearts to there? So when the Christ will be a light, the Holy Spirit will attract people, the Holy Spirit will attract people, and not you will come and to tell them, would you like to give your hearts to God? This is very important. And so, 
The next sign in the prophecy that we are currently studying presented in the character of the voice of the Lord with the character of the voice of a righteous person is supposed to resemble in order to represent the perfection of our Heavenly Father. This is, we will not cry out and lift His voice and will not allow it to be heard in the streets of evil. Streets of evil. We already know what these what the streets of evil is. The first characteristics of the voice of the Lord that is defined by the word will not cry out relates to God. And the second characteristics of the voice that is defined by the word will not lift relates to man. And so in Hebrew, the word will not cry out relates to the Lord and notes that the Son of Man will not be opposed to the will of God until death and death on the cross so that he could redeem his own. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling from down from the ground. Luke 22. So he will not cry out. The full meaning of the word will not cry out in Hebrew defines the character and state of the Son of God as the warrior of prayer. Will not cry out means does not contradict, does not argue with the will of God prepared for him, will not resist, and will not behave defiantly. He will not behave defiantly. This is what it means, will not cry out. Furthermore, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Psalms 39, 7-9. This is what it means to not cry out. This means that when fulfilling the will of God, we will not try. We will not seek something else besides His will. We will not say what we like. We will not ask for God to bless us, that which He has not sent us to. And the word will not lift in Hebrew notes how the Son of God will act toward His people who are bound by skin, by sin and death. And to answer the conditions of the character of this kind of righteousness, it is necessary for us to behave toward these kinds of people as God would behave towards them. Will not lift means will forgive offense, will take the guilt upon himself, will raise them out of ashes, will carry them in prayer towards God, will raise them out of the ruins of death, and will lift them up over their circumstances. This is what it means he will not lift his voice the same way we are supposed to be. We are supposed to have this kind of righteousness in our voice. Ephesians 4, 31-32 Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil, speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The second question. What is meant in the characteristic of righteousness in the act? We will not break a bruised reed nor quench a smoking flax. From what we know, a bruised reed refers to a person who is in the broken tablets of testimony that symbolizes the death of Christ and that this person has died for his nation, his household, and his corrupt desires. He has been bruised. We see this image of death in, in bruising in Jacob when he, in prayer battle, in which death tried to pounce on his flesh in the, fact of his, in the face of his brother Esau, allow God to damage the composition of his hip. A damaged hip on which Jacob limped became the image of him taking up his cross with the cross of Christ. In this cooperation, Jacob died for his nation, his household, and his corrupt ambitions. This gave him the right to the inheritance of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. That was an image of the right to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Interesting that the name Esau means hairy. In the law for the cleansing of a person, it was a requirement for him to shave the hair off his body because the hair that grows on the body of man was an image of the desires and intentions of man that come from his uncrucified soul. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said 
to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. Genesis 32, 40, 24 to 32. A similar prayer in which a person became a bruised reed before God that could serve as a mark that this person has died for nation, his household, and his corrupt desires is presented in bringing a sacrifice of sin. Turtle toes with their its neck snapped. In this kind of sacrifice, the sins of a person that were made before God were forgiven. If he is not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass which he has committed two little doves or two young pigeons. One is a sin offering and the other is a burnt offering. And he shall bring them to the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and wring off its head from its neck, but shall not divide it completely. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. And he shall offer the second as a burnt offering according to the prescribed manner, so that the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his son, which he has sin which he has committed. Flax or linen is a kind of grassy plant from which are made garments for the priests that came toward God so that they did not die. In Scripture, flax represents an image of righteousness that is gained in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the phrase, a smoking flax shall not be quenched, refers to the right of man to come near God in the virtue of fragrant incense so that he does not die. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die in a practical sense the image of a smoking flax is represented in the virtue of a kind of righteousness in which a person becomes the fragrance of Christ unto God which allows him to serve as a fragrance of death for some and, a, and for others as a fragrance of life leading to life for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? If we were not as so many peddling the word of God. And so, the flax linen, a smoking flax shall not quench means that a person has become the fragrance of Christ. God will not quench it. He will quench only the lamp of the wicked, but the lamp of a person with a bruised reed or a bruised hip that cannot rely on their, his nation, on his household, and on his human abilities, when any kind of trial comes, he cannot use his former ties. He has only the Lord. He comes to him and he says, Lord, I willingly have left all that was my strength so that you could become my strength. And now help me because I do not have anyone left. If you desire for God to help you, then right now, when we pray, cast away from all those opportunities that you have, those ab your own abilities, so that God can become your trust. God will not help a person if he has hope on something else besides him. Only when you die for your nation, for your household, and for your possibilities that you have in your soul, your carnal gifts, then God will receive the right to become, to stand before you. And if the storm will be strong to take you in his hands and to carry you, 
Through the storm of death, through illnesses and sorrow, they will come. You are supposed to be tested. But you will come out of them. You will be healed. Remain faithful to God. Believe in His promises that God, in, through Jesus Christ, has healed you, that He has freed you from dependencies of all sin, from all kinds of dependencies. If you fall again and again into sin, be those righteous who fall but get right back up. A righteous will fall seven times but will get right back up. God will not punish you for falling. He says, get up, proclaim you confess your sin. I am with you. I am for you. You are mine. Amen. May we bow our knees and pray. And all those who desire to call out their struggles, you will receive power in Christ. And sooner or later, you will be clothed in healing and the freedom of Christ. We wait for you at the altar. I will pray along with you with your prayers and I ask you to deeply believe that God is for you. He is not against you. He loves you and he desires, desires to free you from dependence of sin. He is ready to forgive your sin and you will never remember, he will never remember it. He has enough power to grow you. He will not, he will not be calm until he heals you and he fills you with your, his love. Of. Your eyes close an element of a mystery room. Your arms raise to the heavens, a sign that you are ready to receive from God that which he desires to give you. Pray along with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you with a wounded heart, with fear, with shame, with illness. I ask you, forgive me. Wash me, cleanse me, heal me, protect me, take away my shame. I accept your word, your Holy Spirit in my heart. Enter it and be a king and ruler of my life. And right now, before heaven and earth, I want to proclaim that according to your word, I am washed, I am cleansed. I am healed. I am justified. I am saved. Amen. Amen. Your sins are forgiven and your lawlessness in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May he shine down on you with his face. May he have mercy upon you. May he give you peace. May among you thousands and tens of thousands fall and may they not come near you. May all of this, these blessings, come upon you and on your descendants, and may they be fulfilled on you, and may the people say, Amen. And now, all of us together will proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen